Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Aaron Dilsaber. And I'm Alexander Starko. And you're watching Science Live! Today we'll be presenting the pentose phosphate pathway. We have many very cool images to show you, starting with the one in the background. This is our starting point for the pathway. And uh, as we bring everything up into full screen, we'll get started talking about the very exciting pentose phosphate pathway. So this first molecule is glucose 6-phosphate. It's important in the first step of uh, the oxidative phase of this reaction. The oxidative phase is very linear, so we can go through this kind of quickly and hit a good review for it. So glucose 6-phosphate is transformed into 6-phosphoglucoacetone. Uh, this is catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, which is shown on screen right now. You can see this is a fairly large enzyme, and the binding pocket is right there in the middle in sort of the X-shaped region formed by a bunch of beta helices, or beta sheets, excuse me, not beta helices, that would be kind well, of groundbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> and in the middle of the beta sheet region is the binding site, as we've already covered. Now, this is a dehydrogenation reaction. The hemiacetyl hydroxyl group on carbon-1 of uh, glucose 6-phosphate is turned into a carbonyl group, which generates a lactone ring in 6-phosphoglucoacetone, uh, as shown. There's our lactone re ring. NADPH is generated in this reaction, and that's the most important point, is that's an important reducing reagent uh, in many cellular cycles. Now, this takes place in the next reac reaction in the cycle, the second one overall, where it's transformed into 6-phosphogluconate. This is catalyzed by 6-phosphoglucolactonase. <laughs> and it's a very simple hydrolysis reaction, but does need a fairly hefty dimeric enzyme in order to carry it out. Um, in a hydrolysis reaction, uh, H H2O water is used and uh, simply protons are generated in that reaction. Our 6-phosphoglucanate is changed into ribulose 5-phosphate in the last reaction of the oxidative phase. Uh, this is catalyzed by 6-phosphoglucanate dehydrogenase. Uh, this is 6-phosphoglucanate shown on screen right now, which is the first reagent in the step. Uh, the next step is catalyzed by 6-phosphoglucanate dehydrogenase which is one that uh, we couldn't quite find. But, um, it's an oxidative decarboxylation reaction where NADP plus is used as an electron acceptor. And this step of the reaction generates NADPH, CO2, and ribulose 5-phosphate. This is the first step in the pentose phosphate pathway in which the carbon balance is changed. And that's just shown through the CO2 given off. I'm going to throw it over to Xander, who's going to go over sort of the overall reaction during this oxidative phase. Uh, first, we're going to get ribulose 5-phosphate up. As you see, this is a 5-carbon sugar in difference to the 6-carbon sugars that we've already got up. Okay. Well, now as we can see from, see from the carbon balance that is currently displayed on the screen here, <coughs> this is the oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate site. Pop pentose phosphate pathway, excuse me. And uh, it's fairly similar to most oxidative state, oxidative phases of uh, most metabolic processes, uh, including glycolysis and the enter deuteroff pathway. In short, a glucose derivative is reduced to a smaller carbon derivative, releasing CO2, and, and at the same time generating NADPH for use in metabolic biosynth biosynthetic pathways. So now we'll enter into the more complicated start uh, point of this reaction um, <laughs> as we get everything off the screen there. So now we're headed into the non-oxidative phase. This is more non-linear. There are a couple different branching points. We'll try to cover these as best as we can. But we start with our good friend here, ribulose 5-phosphate. This can be changed into one of two different products. Uh, the first product is ribose 5-phosphate. Uh, and this is done via ribulose 5-phosphate isomerase. And that's a pretty simple uh, reaction. As you can see, it uses a fairly simple enzyme to do this. It changes the structural formula without changing any of the atoms in the 
molecule. In particular, it changes L, -ribo L ribulose into, sorry, L ribose into D ribose. Um, the other possibility for this reaction is that ribulose 5 phosphate can be turned into xylulose 5 phosphate via uh, ribulose 5 phosphate epimerase. Now, if you haven't heard the term uh, epimer before, it's just a shifting of hydrogens simply. If a hydrogen is in the top position in uh, one of the epimers, it's in the bottom position in the other epimer. It's just a very simple change. And this brings to mind a popular saying that they don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. Why Oscar Gamble? It's a very valuable bit of information to learn from that simple reaction. Now on to even more complicated. This was just a simple one uh, branch. Now we're going to have two different reactants enter and create uh, two different products. Our first set of reactants is both of the steps of this reaction. Xylulose 5-phosphate and ribose 5-phosphate will combine in order to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, uh, which is, you know, your uh, eyes should light up, your mind should light up. You should know quite a bit about glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The other product it produces is, is cetoheptulose 7-phosphate. Now, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, a very important molecule, and uh, this can be combined together. Two of them uh, can be combined to form fructose 6-phosphate, which is used in glycolysis. Uh, and that's kind of where this feeds back into some of the other pathways. Now, this sort of branching reaction are two 5-carbon molecules combining to form a 3-carbon and a 7-carbon molecule. Uh, this is done via transketolase, is the name of the enzyme, and it does exactly what it sounds like it does. It will transfer a keto group uh, from one of the 5-carbon molecules into uh, the 7-carbon molecule. This is the transketolase enzyme. Uh, as you can see, it's very large, and it includes many alpha helices. Uh, and yeah. The next stage of this uh, will take those two products, our acetoheptulose 7-phosphate uh, and our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Uh, so again, there's 10 carbons entering, and it will change them into erythrose 4-phosphate, which is an important precursor to uh, several amino acids, but we'll get more to that later. And it will also form fructose 6-phosphate. And fructose 6-phosphate, as we said, is simply two uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates melded together. And that'll form uh, fructose 6-phosphate, which goes into the uh, glycolytic cycle. This is done via transaldolase which is another fairly complicated enzyme. Uh, as you see, this one is even perhaps more complicated than the other one. It is a dim uh, dimeric structure, as you can see. Uh, it's actually a fairly cool little, it's like a dimer of pentamers, if you will. I can see a smiley face right here, see? Smiley face. Uh, I was actually thinking just individual flowers almost with the center. Aside from that, it is a spectacular enzyme. Very complicated and very interesting. And then the last reaction that we're going to go over uh, is an, our only nine carbon reaction. Xylulose 5-phosphate uh, and erythrose 4-phosphate will form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. This is basically just maximizing the amount of glycolytic products that we can get out of this cycle. Uh, this is done via uh, the same transketolase enzyme, I believe. And uh, that'll basically take us all the way through the pathway. All these branching enzymes, it's really important to note that in the reactions, the carbon balance is exactly the same. There's two reactions that are 10 carbons each, the first two, and the last reaction is nine carbons on each side of the reaction. So if you keep track of your carbons, the pathway becomes fairly linear and fairly easy to understand. The pentose phosphate pathway is not so much a <clears throat> uh, catabolic cycle. It is um, more of a 
anabolic cycle. Honestly, it uh, creates products that are necessary for other metabolic cycles and other bio, and in particular some very important biosynthetic cycles. For instance, uh, glucose glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, a very important molecule in the entire cycle, as shown here. Uh, is feeds into uh, amine synthesis and uh, so for the very important cycles. Um, some of the primary functions of the pentosphosphate pathway is it generates reducing equivalents such as NADPH and it produces uh, ribose 5 phosphate, which is used in synthesis of nucleosides and nucleic, uh, nucleic acids. Furthermore, the production of erythrose 4 phosphate. Uh, is you, is um, very important as it is a molecule that's used in synthesis of aromatic amino acids. And furthermore, uh, the metosphosphate pathway in fact accounts for 60% of all NADPH formation in humans. So this is a very important pathway uh, in basically all living organisms that it occurs in. And it's been really great to be able to bring some of this to you. Um, we hope you've enjoyed our cast and hope you don't, you'll tune in next week for our segment on DNA replication. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much and have a good night.